The opinions expressed in the following program are provided for general information purposes only and should not be construed as advice from CJAD 800 or Bell Media. The following is sponsored content. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult F.L. Fuller Landau, Chartered Professional Accountants and Business Advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Welcome to Today's Entrepreneur, a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business, presented by FL Montreal. My name is Dan Delmar, and in for Josh Miller tonight on a special crisis management edition of the show is FL Managing Partner Michael Newton. Good evening, Michael. Hey, Dan. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. So very particular circumstances on the show tonight. So uh, our regularly scheduled guest will come back on the program a little later, Trois Femmes en Cousin, when things, you know, calm down a little bit. But in the meantime, this is, I think, actually a first for these sorts of shows here at CJAD. We have actually um, been doing this broadcast remotely. We're, we're all at our offices right now, each other's offices. Uh, I am producing this from, from TNKR Media. You are at FL Montreal, Michael. Yeah. And uh, we're doing a special on crisis management and how to respond uh, uh, in these times, particularly for entrepreneurs, for leaders, CEOs, people that have to manage an organization or a workforce. So, Michael, in these past few days, it's been really hectic. We're going to have advice on this program from our tax specialist, from our HR specialist, and also on the technology and telemedicine front. Um, so that's all coming up this hour. Uh, first, though, general impressions. It's been a rough couple of weeks for Canadian business. Um, what are your thoughts on, uh, on what's to come for the next few weeks? Well, it's interesting, Dan, that you start by saying this is a first for uh, CJD, because I would uh, venture to say this is probably a first situation for just about everybody who's in business. We've never quite seen something to this magnitude, uh, and, and uh, you know, magnitude and or uh, uh, paranoia, I guess, which is uh, which has found its way throughout uh, the world marketplace. Um, this is definitely a difficult time. I think the you know what what most people are are searching for right now is leadership. I think if you look at where the biggest problems have found themselves politically, has been in a lack of uh, of leadership. Uh, not because uh, they don't know what to deal with, not because they necessarily don't uh, know how to lead, but because the circumstances really provide for an opportunity. I think for those people to step. Uh, step out of the normal sense of leadership and really find a way for them to uh, to take control of a situation that really doesn't have much to control. And I think how you handle that as a business owner is going to go a long way in uh, calming not only your team, but your customers, your suppliers and uh, and your family. So from a communication standpoint, uh, one thing I always recommend in crisis management is to have a hub ready to go. So it's, it could be a, a Google document or a wiki file in your internal system, could be a PDF that you update regularly. And on that PDF, I'm looking at uh, our template of it right now here, we like to have emergency contacts for communications. So it could be your marketing person, your PR consultant. Uh, there could be some emails for local newsrooms here. If you have to get an announcement out to the public really quickly, uh, there's some talking points to prepare for specific types of eventualities. And there's also uh, different parts of your crisis plan to inform your own employees and your own clients and to implement um, various procedures to make sure that uh, you can run your business as smoothly as usual. What are your uh, key elements, Michael, uh, in, in a good crisis plan? So, you know, it's funny. People used to call this a disaster recovery plan, which was really when your system crashed from a technology perspective. What did you do to, to get back up or to stay in business? Now, really, that business contingency plan should form part of, of everybody's uh, ongoing uh, permanent information. You know, funny enough, when we do we did ours a couple of years ago at the office, uh, there was no doubt I had eyes being rolled and people going, really, we've got better things to do, figuring we would never be in a situation where we'd ever have to call on it. Um, the reality is, in the last little while, as much as we didn't necessarily have to go back to the specific document, the concept of having run through that has come has come a long way in helping us. And, and there's no doubt that communication, and, and I know Michelin will get to this later on from a staffing perspective, but communication is vital. Uh, I think ultimately, at the end of the day, your team is looking for direction. Uh, your customers and your suppliers are looking for direction. And it's a time where, you know, you need to be able to send a message uh, that given no matter what's going on, at least, you know, p people behind the scenes are not panicking. Um, the other area that, that's key, obviously, in today is is the use of technology. I mean, there's no doubt that um, where we were a few years ago, uh, you know, we've all would have had a very difficult time. I mean, right now, as of Friday afternoon, we basically told everybody that they could work from home at a remote location. 
and I would say that probably 90% of our office is quite capable of, uh, of working in that environment. We had spent the money on infrastructure. We had spent the money on the laptops. We had spent money on uh, the VPN or the virtual networks. Uh, in order for people to work securely. So, you know, a lot of these things that that, that come back to, I guess, keep uh, and, and quell a little bit of the panic and, and along, you know, is, is a many, many years of, of buildup and you never know if you're ever going to need it. So right now we're using the Google suite of products uh, to both re record and connect remotely. Uh, here we, we prefer that at TNKR. It's a very user-friendly user interface, but there are lots of products you can use. And we're going to talk a little bit about technology and telemedicine also uh, later in the program. Um, there's Skype, of course. There's Slack. Uh, there's Zoom. There are a lot of different programs where you can share your screen and see your colleagues face-to-face. -face. It's pretty much, Michael, almost like you're, you're really there. And so we're almost there. We've almost digitized our workplace. Places, but there's a little more effort, I think, that has to be uh, put into this. And it's partially why we're doing this show. Um, I think some people thought I was a little crazy uh, yesterday trying to organize a remote broadcast uh, for, for these types of shows in one day. But I want to tell uh, Canadian business owners something very clearly, and that is that we all need to make an effort to adapt to these times and to, to, digi to digitize and to basically have our businesses ready to, to operate on the web. You know, it, it's very interesting because part of the, I guess, the hesitation that we've had to this point has come from those people that are less tech savvy or less tech comfortable. Um, I mean, our mandate to, to our team last Friday and, and through the weekend was any physical meetings that are set up for the next couple of weeks should be rescheduled through video or audio conferencing, uh, as well as obviously the use of technology. Well, you know what? It, 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 there are a number of people who have really very much hesitated, partially because they believe that face-to-face -face is the only way to do business, and under most circumstances, I, I have a tendency to agree. However, in situations, especially of one of public health and public interest, we have to be willing to accept that both sides uh, and make and may in some cases need leadership from us to say, you know what, guys, we're not coming on site tomorrow, not only for our team, for the best interest of your team, and you have to get con people to convinced to use the technology that is there. You know, I'll find the silver lining in this in this whole conversation is really that a whole bunch of people that may have been afraid to use technology are going to be forced over the next few weeks. And you know what? Maybe that'll be a springboard. Welcome back to today's Entrepreneur, inspiring stories from outstanding business people, Dan Delmar and Michael Newton with you, managing partner at FL Montreal for this special edition of today's Entrepreneur. It's our crisis management special, and it's, of course, uh, in the wake of, of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we're offering tips to entrepreneurs and leaders and managers on a variety of subjects. We uh, we will talk about taxes in a little while, plus innovation technology that's coming up on the program with Daniel Martz of EQ Care. Uh, but first, human resources, an incredibly important aspect to manage your workforce, to manage your colleagues, and to be able to make sure to uh, convey clear, concise, and uh, in some cases, very important safety information. Uh, Michael, HR is such an important uh, part to this whole equation. So let's bring in Michelle Mayette. She's the HR advisor at FL. Montreal and a regular contributor to the show, of course. Uh, welcome back, Micheline. Hi, Dan. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good, good. Michael, uh, as I mentioned, HR is super important, making sure that your workforce is well informed and calm in a crisis. Yeah, there's no doubt that, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier, that the the, the need to to make sure that everybody is, is I guess, uh, feeling comfortable given the media storm that's around them. And I think that, you know, as employers, we have a, a couple of jobs to do in a time like this. And one of them is to make sure that we can be as communicative as possible without that fine line of overburdening people with communications. Micheline, I'm sure you're seeing uh, a lot of questions coming from clients. What are, what are some of the, the key areas on communication that you're, you're, you're addressing? Um, I think sometimes they're struggling with what to communicate, how often to communicate also. I think part of it is that there's new information coming out all the time. So sometimes when they want to communicate too much information all at once, by the time they actually get ready to press send, they find their information is obsolete. So I think one thing is to communicate often, even if we don't have all the information is probably one key thing. You know, it, it's interesting because I think a lot of times uh, as leaders, you want, you never want to look like you're wrong. Um, but I think in a situation like this, the ability to update with with breaking news or, or new information is significantly more important than holding the ego line saying that, hey, you know, what I told you yesterday may not have been 100 percent. And people need to address the fact that that communication is, is out, you know, could be outdated very quickly. And that, you know, that just happens to be part of the circumstances. For sure. I think people are looking for a lot of clarity. I, I think one of the main fears 
I mean, obviously it's for safety. So people, you know, when you have uh, situations where you could work from home already, that helps a lot. I think employers who have employees who need to be on site are the ones that are probably struggling the most right now. Um, so especially with people who have to stay home with their children, I mean, I think we've already seen measures in place for people who have to be on quarantine or who are sick at home. So I think those people feel, you know, they, they have quite a bit of information. So I think for the, the employees who are wondering, you know, where their next paycheck is going to come from, if, for example, they've had to stay home with children, um, and there's a lot of fear too. So there's some, you know, some employers that are telling me employers are scared to come to work. Um, they're scared to take public transit. They're scared to be in a work environment with other people. So I think, you know, employers have to be conscious of this and try to reassure people as much as possible and make sure to communicate the measures that they're taking regularly, but also to adapt uh, as things change. I think there's also a very important difference uh, based on the type of business or industry that you are in. Obviously, for a professional services firm like ours, you know, we, we've been set up in such a way where people can ro work remotely uh, and be, you know, pretty efficient, pretty business as usual at the end of the day. If you're a manufacturer and you've got an assembly line and you've got, you know, 50 to 100 people uh, working in, in the facility, you know, the ability to, to be able to take that home with you and manufacture just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's an awful lot of people right now that are questioning somewhere between what is the employer going to continue to pay and pick up from a moral perspective and how much is the government going to kick in at, at any given time? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things we're waiting for. Um, you know, the Quebec government just made an announcement because, uh, you know, one of the things is, you know, people are worried that employees will continue to go to work, even though they should be on quarantine because, you know, exactly that they're worried about not getting paid. Um, so the Quebec government just announced in a press conference that they're going to put measures in place for people who are not eligible for EI. Uh, so, you know, employment insurance has been bona fide recently to, to you know, waive the one week waiting period um, and to let people know that if they are in quarantine uh, or sick, then they will you know, receive EI benefits. Some of it's a little bit unclear at this point. Um, but at this point, we're waiting to see what about, you know, the other people who have to stay home again because of their children or, or for other reasons, or if it's not a mandatory quarantine, um, but a self-quarantine, how that's going to work. Uh, the government said that they're, they're most likely going to be waiving medical notes because at this point, uh, you know, they don't want to overburden the medical system and they're asking, you know, employers to, to waive medical notes. So you know, I think just a lot of things are unclear. So while people feel like hopefully they'll be, you know, receive compensation from somewhere, where that's going to come from, and also how long it's going to take, you know, before they receive the money, if everybody's making employment insurance claims at once, is the government equipped to process all of these claims rapidly? Yeah, and, and I think one of the things that we're, we're, we're starting to hear and feel is at what point um, do, does it become responsible for the government to step in and how much is, has to be placed on the employers? Um, one of the questions that was posed to me this morning by a client is, well, what do we do uh, if we're going to shut down the system for a few days? And, uh, you know, do I have to notify like an, I would normally do in, in a case of, uh, of laying people off? Am I actually laying people off? What is this considered? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, those things are unclear too. And there's a lot of information on the CNESST website um, so if people go to the CNA SST site, they'll see that they've answered, they've put some questions and answers for employers. So one of them is regarding even temporary layoffs, uh, because a lot of businesses also are going to be unfortunately having to lay people off, for example, uh, businesses that have actually had to close uh, during this period. Not all of them have money to necessarily keep paying people. Um, and they indicated that employees actually do not necessarily have to be notified in writing of a temporary layoff. It could actually even be a verbal and notification. Anyways, it's just to say that it's important also for employers to make sure that they're getting information from the right sources. So the CNESST website obviously is a very good source. Um, also on the uh, site of the Ordre des Conseillers Ressources Humaines du Québec, they've published a guide for employers. It's already a few days old, which at this point means it's very old, but there's still a, very, a lot of very good information in there, um, especially regarding how to um, prevent discrimination in the workplace because sometimes employers don't know what types of questions to ask. So, you know, you can ask employees um, if, for example, they've traveled abroad, if they have family members 
you know, who may have traveled abroad or may have, um, you know, been affected by the illness or also if they're having symptoms themselves. So it's just important to distinguish between what questions you can ask and accidentally asking other questions like, do you have young children or, you know, do you have any medical conditions which are still considered no-nos right now? Um, but it's important to know that also, you know, in this type of circumstance, um, while you still have to respect employees' privacy, in some situations it can outweigh, obviously, the health and safety of your employees would outweigh privacy when you have to find the balance between both of these things. Yeah, I think it's an important point because, you know, we live in, in the, probably one of the most stringent pro uh, provinces with regards to privacy matters. And there was a certain period in time where, uh, you know, the question uh, can come up to say, hey, you know, you want to make sure that uh, if, you, if you've got encouraged people to stay home, then... Um, you know, it, it's very nice to say that uh, you're not making it mandatory, but if you have somebody who's pregnant or somebody who has a weak immune system, I mean, how are you supposed to know that without making a general statement? And, and I think this becomes uh, a very interesting dialogue between employer and employee uh, going forward. Um, mm -hmm. So on on that, uh, I think we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to wrap up, Michelin. I think there are so many questions that are going to be answered after the fact and a lot of these things. And I think the longer that this goes on, uh, I think the more uh, people like yourself are going to find that they're going to be very busy come uh, May and uh, May and June in order to try and support everything that's uh, that's that, that's going to be coming at us. Micheline Mayette, HR advisor at FL Montreal. Thanks so much for joining us again uh, this evening, Micheline. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. And coming up next, Michael, we're going to talk to Ernie Furt, tax partner at FL. He's going to talk about taxes, of course, and what government aid is available. Uh, we're not hearing too many details so far, but we have some indication from, from the finance minister about what is to come. And we'll have that next on Today's Entrepreneur. Welcome back to Today's Entrepreneur, inspiring stories from outstanding Quebec business people. And it's a special edition this week, a crisis management edition of the program. My name is Dan Delmar, alongside FL Montreal managing partner Michael Newton, and we're talking to our experts. We're going to talk about telemedicine and technology with Daniel Martz of EQ Care, a recent guest on Today's Entrepreneur a few years ago. And for the time being, we're going to look on, on taxes. And that's an incredibly important issue, of course. It is tax time uh, here in Canada. And well, where do we go from here? And so Michael, um, we'll bring in Ernie Furt, our tax partner at FL, uh, with as much information as we have. Uh, welcome back, Ernie. But um, we're hearing that there's still some gaps in uh, in what needs to be conveyed by the government so far. Hi, Dan. Yeah, there's there's a lot of gaps uh, right now. You know, the, the the Eric Girard is saying the April 30th deadline may be troubling in nature, uh, but he's not going forward and saying he's going to extend it. Most likely. They're going to wait for the federal government to extend the, the personal tax deadline. But there's a couple other deadlines that are coming before that. One deadline is today, which is uh, personal installments for 2020. March 15th fell on a Sunday. So today is March 16th, hence the, the, the first installment for 2020. So if you haven't paid it, pay it. Uh, I suggest doing all those things, paying everything, doing status quo with respect to, uh, to to your tax situation and getting uh, your tax people all your documentation so they can do your returns virtually as best as possible. So Ernie, one of the things I think from a from a personal tax component that that, that we're starting to see is everybody you know goes into panic mode this time of year on a, on a regular basis. And now I think we, until such time as we know what the delays are going to be, um, you know, is there a way for us to use technology in a better uh, communication way between our clients? I mean, traditionally it's been shoebox or uh, or a bag or whatever may come in from from clients. Is there a way that we can get our clients to be a little more, uh, I guess, tech savvy as as we move into this sector for the for the next uncertain period? Over the past couple of years, both the federal and Quebec government have allowed us to download certain documents uh, like T4s and Releve 1s, uh, T5s, Releve 3s, T3 slips, etc. So we have the makeup of most of the tax return. We're, what we're missing generally is donation expenses, which a client can take an Excel sheet and list all his donation expenses, put the totals in there, and we could put that number in, and as long as we have the receipts to support it, we're good to go. Even this morning in the car, I was listening to the radio, and there was a commercial for Jean Coutu, where they said you can, if you're a member of the Jean Coutu online, you can get a summary of all your prescriptions 
for uh, 2019 uh, downloaded and easy for you. So what, you know, it, it's an interesting concept because, you know, we, we, we've heard this in the past where clients have said, well, you know, that's not up to me to make my list of, uh, of donations and, and medical receipts. And I completely understand that comment. What we don't know over the next few weeks is whether the, the fact that we are sitting with a large part of our, our team working from home on a remote basis, where obviously electronic is not much easier, I would think that trying to, to create that communication and, and break down, uh, I guess, the physical contact is something that, that we, should, we should be considering as much as, as possible. Moving over to the U.S., I think one of the interesting uh, aspects is, you know, what happens? We say, well, the U.S. tax return IRS deadline is April 15th. It doesn't really affect Canada or, or our clients here in Montreal. I think, Ernie, you might want to take uh, take exception to that statement. Well, it's not a question of taking exception. There's In the U.S., there's many deadlines and there's many extensions. Uh, effectively, the House passed a bill over the weekend that the Senate has to vote on and that the, uh, and the president has to sign into law to extend that U.S. deadline from April 15th. But most people in the U.S. will extend anyways, and that extension goes out for six months, which is to uh, uh, October 15th. And automatically, any people, uh, any Americans in Canada who have to file U.S. returns have till June 15th to file that, and they can also extend. So it's a little bit less troubling, but, you know, the, the extension is not an, an extension to pay, it's an extension to file. So the question is, with this bill that may be passed this week, will it be an extension to pay as well? You know, you have to stay tuned. Every day changes things. And we just have to speak to our clients and ensure that they remain as calm as possible. Have a little family activity and put your tax receipts together and give it to your accountant. That's one thing you could do. Boy, we must be getting really, uh, really hard up to be sitting at home having to get together our tax receipts together. But hey, well, I guess I get, I guess it's better than Scrabble on some days. Well, we can't use that. a fireplace anymore, so I guess we have to prepare our tax receipts. Um, jumping over to corporate, uh, a lot of companies have December year end, especially the small business. Uh, your filing deadline is six months, but your payment deadline is the end of March uh, for for federal. What are you recommending to your clients at this point that they do until such time we hear anything different? Uh, what I recommend is, is to pay the installments as they become due, pay your balance of taxes as it becomes due, because if there's no announcements, there is no leeway. If there is announcements, then you're going to get that leeway. But just be prudent and, and, and do the best that you can to pay all your liabilities when they're due to avoid any interest charges. You know, it was interesting this morning, there was conversations with a couple of bankers who have, you know, clients were asking uh, in terms of, you know, reporting information to the banks, their margin calculations, you know, how open is the bank going to be to either things being late or being offside given the financial circumstances? And the answer from one banker was, we will be understanding. Um, I'm not sure we can necessarily feel that uh, we will be understanding is actually a hard and fast rule. And I, I have some concerns of what that may mean from a government perspective. We have hit crisis before. Uh, I think there's going to be an awful lot of this that we're going to decide after the fact at, uh, at the end of the day. So thank you very much, Ernie. Thanks for the update. My and, pleasure. Uh, as, uh, as more information comes out, we will try and make it available to everyone. Thank you very much, Michael. And on the way, we're going to take a look at technology and how that can play a key role. Of course, lots of uh, remote working apps, uh, Google, Skype, etc. We're also going to talk about telemedicine with Daniel Marks, the CEO of a local company called EQ Care. They do telemedicine for business, and we'll talk about that as part of the solution as well. Special edition of Today's Entrepreneur on Crisis Management on Newstalk Radio CJAD 800. Welcome back to a special edition of Today's Entrepreneur, the Crisis Management Edition. My name is Dan Delmar. This program presented as always, of course, by FL Montreal. And joining me in for Josh Miller tonight is FL Managing Partner Michael Newton. So it's been an interesting program so far today, Michael, talking about taxes, HR, and crisis management. We're going to focus now to more positive solutions. So we're going to have your one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur in a crisis coming up in a few minutes. Uh, but first, on the tech, let's bring in a friend of both TNKR's and FL Montreal's. Uh, that's EQ Care. They do telemedicine, and uh, the CEO of EQ Care joins us right now. His name is Daniel Martz. Daniel, welcome to Today's Entrepreneur. Thanks for having me. I should say welcome back because you were one of our guests uh, maybe about seven, eight years ago. Um, and we appreciate your time this evening. Michael, telemedicine. I mean, some of these solutions are going to be technology based as we've been discussing. Um, are you seeing more demand for these types of services uh, in, in your area? 
in the last four days, definitely. Uh, interestingly enough, telemedicine has been a topic that many companies have looked into over the last uh, couple of years. And I would say whether it was costs or an inability to uh, feel like they can put it out there and then take it back, a lot of people have stayed away from it. And the reality is I think telemedicine is, is a huge opportunity, especially in crisis like this. So, Daniel, what, what, what are you seeing right now as the move other than the panic? What, what has been the movement towards telemedicine and what's been driving it? Yes. I mean, it, it is a really nice way to increase and accelerate access to care. In the, you know, in the corporate market, we've seen companies large and small purchase these services as an employee assistance program to accelerate access to both physical and mental health care for employees. In an era of a pandemic like we're now seeing, this has much broader public health implications to improve access in scenarios where outpatient clinics are being closed, ERs are being overrun, and pretty much all preventative health care is being put on hold in order to increase capacity of emergency services to serve those most in need. So having this kind of an approach across the system helps to unlock the capacity of health professionals who are forced, like many of us, to be in our homes uh, during this period and enabling them to uh, you know, essentially lend their capacity to the system, um, which is, you know, creates a virtuous circle where they can help the system address this kind of very complicated set of dynamics they can add value, and they can also be in a safe environment, um, you know, during these times. One of the things that, that that I would like to maybe address is, you know, most like anything else, like crisis management uh, brings out uh, the extremes. Um, I think there's a lot of advantages to corporate uh, corporate Canada in terms of uh, lost time of employees not being behind their desks when they have an opportunity to use telemedicine. Uh, and I think most employers look at the hard dollar costs of paying for telemedicine versus the soft dollar costs of, uh, of absorbing the time of, of having people actually leave their office to go to the doctor. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yes. So there, you know, there are very nice benefits in the form of increased productivity. So, you know, in a in a scenario where real life is happening, you know, today, again, real life has, has been put on hold. But in many cases, when people need to leave their desks to access care, there's travel time, there's wait time, there's all the associated complexities associated with figuring out what kind of services are needed. And all of that mental load is taken away from productive work in the form of real lost productivity time, and then what's called presenteeism, which is when someone is sitting at their desk, but they're not really focused on their work. So employers have looked at telemedicine services to alleviate both you know, hard dollar costs associated with lost uh, work time and then the softer costs in, for, in the form of uh, presenteeism. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, all of the additional you know, administrative tasks associated with getting access to medical testing, specialist care, prescriptions at the pharmacy, all of those steps in a lot of cases can be taken care of virtually, which provides a holistic way of accessing care from where you're most safe and comfortable and, and, and a huge return on investment for corporations who have come on board. Has, has anybody at this point, and this is the numbers guy in me, has anybody actually tried to quantify uh, from a regular office type job, what kind of time saving is involved in something like this? Because I, I, I think, you know, the opportunity for telemedicine to be on the radar based on what we're living right through in a pandemic is huge. The opportunity for us to consider this as part of our ongoing health care after the pandemic is over is going to come down to, to, to numbers and dollars and cents. Yes. So I think very simply, if you paint yourself into any normal scenario where you're faced with needing to access care for you or a member of your family, you will typically come to the conclusion that you're going to take between four and eight hours out of a day. If you know, you're going to leave your work or your home, you're going to get in your car, you're going to sit in a waiting room, you're going to then potentially spend, you know, 10 minutes in the clinician's room, and then another 15 minutes in a test, but all of the surrounding time associated with waiting, traveling, 
and stressing truthfully about the experience will typically land you in a four to eight hour cost of productivity for each visit that you have. So, you know, the, the simple math for that kind of lost productivity is what does a day of work cost? So, you know, back of the envelope math for everyone here, you know, someone who makes $50,000 a year, that's about $250 a day of lost productivity. So, okay. you know, you very quickly see the return on the cost of a visit to the system and that one day of lost productivity. And then that multiplies as you need to go then seek specialist care, the next steps in care and so forth. So the return on investment becomes very clear when you break it down into numbers. Not, not to mention the the easing on the uh, the system itself by not having to be present and sit and bring your germs with you when you go to the doctor's office or the emergency room. Absolutely. So last quick question, I guess, on, on this topic is maybe dumb it down for us. I mean, telemedicine is floating around. I'm not sure everybody really recognizes what that means in terms of is that the ability to go online virtually and talk to a doctor and have a prescription filled? Yeah, so the basics of telemedicine are that you have access to a medical professional or actually mental health or paramedical professional like a physio, occupational therapist or a nutritionist through an application. So through voice, video or text, you have an interaction remotely from the safety and comfort of your home. And in many cases, the practitioner is also in their own home or office. And you're able to address not only basic issues which can be solved with voice, text, and video, but more complex issues associated with caring for a chronic disease. So you can actually get a prescription, a lab, a medical test requisition, or a specialist referral from a physician who is providing care to you remotely. And then you need to travel only to get that test or to the specialist, alleviating all of the steps associated with accessing the first line of care. So this is really the basics of what telemedicine is. And if you paint that out again in today's current environment, when many health practitioners are being forced to stay at home and many uh, employees are working from home, this unlocks an unbelievable amount of capacity, solving the basics of healthcare issues that in under normal circumstances, many would actually step into an ER or a clinic when in fact they don't really need to. They would be able to solve it remotely through a telemedicine approach. Daniel Martz, the CEO of EQ Care. Thanks so much for joining us today, Daniel. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. And Michael, it's been an, a really interesting show. We'll, we'll keep our listenership updated for next week. It looks like we'll probably have to do another week under these sort of remote circumstances. Uh, so stay tuned for, uh, for what's going to be on next time. And in the meantime, Michael, uh, why don't we end with your one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur in a crisis? Well, it's something we should all have on a regular basis, but it's uh, it's even more important, I think, in times like this, and that's level-headed leadership, the ability to lead without it being all about you and, you know, make sure that your troops and your team and your family and whoever you're dealing with uh, has somebody that they can rely on, because right now in a time of crisis, I think that's probably the hardest thing for people to, to deal with. Excellent advice. And if you want some inspiration, don't forget todaysentrepreneur.org. There's a decade worth of entrepreneur profiles for you there. We will be back on the air uh, one way or another next Monday night at 7 p.m. So stay tuned for that. And a special thanks to Jessica Malis and Robert Hiltz, uh, my colleagues at TNKR Media, for putting together this show very rapidly. And we'll see you back here next Monday night. Good night. Thanks, Dan. This has been a production of TNKR Media. Good talk.